Martha has done a great job, and I want to thank her and her team for uh, allowing me to speak today. Uh, when I found out I was going to be the first speaker, I was going to do a big introduction, but I'm, I'm actually going to uh, save my intro as I go through this entire talk, so you actually get to learn a little bit more about me as this talk goes along. Uh, so my talk is learning how to innovate inside the box. And it's really, I'm actually trying to encourage everyone to think outside the box, okay? But I use that inside the box as a cute way of uh, defining really why, why I think innovation is. And hopefully from this talk, you get a sense for what we're doing for cyber defense uh, from the U.S. Army's perspective. And I work at the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, it's at West Point, New York. I teach systems engineering. That's my sort of my part-time job now. Um, and what I want to do here is give you a little background on what the ACI, the Army Cyber Institute, is uh, before I get started with the talk. And there's a three-minute video here that CNET did on us that was really nice. So again, this video gives a little bit of introduction on West Point itself, the curriculum, uh, cyber education, and then the Army Cyber Institute itself. We visited West Point, the Army's prestigious 200-year-old military academy, to watch the annual Cyber Defense Exercise, dubbed CDX, a yearly competition among service academies to see which teams can protect their servers from NSA hackers. People are starting to realize that we've built all these things that we're now relying on, but we sort of built it out in front of the idea of security, and so things are kind of getting away from us. And now we need to take some time to kind of ratchet it back in and figure out how we're going to manage this really complex world we built. The West Point team spent months creating a server that could handle email, file transfers, and other services for thousands of simulated users. For several days, the group of two dozen cadets huddled together in a computer lab to guard their systems against exploits from the NSA. Cyber is the new frontier, always learning new things, always developing new things, and being able to protect something that's so important in our everyday life is definitely crucial. A scoreboard was projected in the front, showing how well Army was faring against competing teams, with grades based on how well each Any Navy affiliates here? Network. Naturally, the Army team... My brother's in the Navy, so that's okay. ...live on Twitch. How about Air the Force? The team takes home this big, shiny trophy. This year, though, Marines? Army's big rival, Navy, won. We're also here to visit the Army Cyber Institute, which is a new think tank here that asks all the different questions about what the future of cyber defense may look like. We met its director, Colonel Andrew O'Hall. He talked about the Army's efforts to predict potential ways the country could face an attack, a concept called threat casting, now that internet connections are just about everywhere. With threat casting, you're, just, you're trying to put yourself into what the attack surface would look like in 10 years, because we know the attack surface is going to be huge. He went on to describe a series of potential cyber threats we may face in the future, such as a personal care robot being hacked and harming its owner, or a hack on a dam that causes a catastrophic disaster. Pulse Think Tank is also considering the potential of some pretty sci-fi concepts, like augmented soldiers and autonomous drones. One of the main efforts we've been doing is trying to figure out how the Army will bring cyber and cyber effects to the battlefield. I don't know if it's terrifying or comforting that high-level Army officials are thinking about robot attacks and bionic soldiers. And sure, cyber attacks may worsen, but efforts like these should help the military prepare a little more for what's coming. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the Army Cyber Institute is. Again, in three minutes, it's hard to tell the whole story, but uh, Colonel Hall, who you, who you saw in the video there, uh, my boss, he's the one that actually got me turned on to b size The first uh, cyber conference I attended was b size in New York City in January of 2015. And uh, I was new to the cyber world, uh, been a user my entire life. I'm not worried about uh, all cybersecurity issues, right? I always figure we have all these IT folks that uh, can figure it out for us. Uh, and then when I had started attending these conferences, I found out, wow, this is actually a pretty serious issue. And that's the great thing about you're here today. Uh, you're going to hear some great speech uh, talks today that uh, go into some of that in more detail. And um, what I really want to talk about today is, is this notion of revolutionary innovation. Yeah, I told you the talk is really thinking inside the box, but I'm trying to promote outside the box thinking. And I don't think of innovations as this monolithic entity. What I do is I break it up into two uh, axes. Uh, so in order to distinguish between innovations, 
I first draw a technological complexity or sophistication. Right? How, how complex is it, or how tech savvy is it? The more it is, or the less it is, it defines what type of innovation. On the other axis, I define whether or not that innovation is targeting a new market, or an underserved market, or some existing market. And when we come up with this, on the low and low quadrant, we have sustaining innovations. These are the innovations that are simply meeting customer needs, right? There's improvement that's taking place over time. But you can think about uh, most products, right? They product differentiate, they add features to it, just to give it uh, a flavor that's continued to improve. On the high-tech side, but still targeting existing markets, I call that evolutionary innovation, right? You can think of Darwin, the notion of uh, improving based on what your competitors are doing and using technology to help you with that. On the high-tech new market side, right, these are harder to do. I call that breakthrough innovations or jump in the curve. And you'll see in a little while why I call this jump in the curve. Um, and finally, uh, the title of my talk really is trying to get towards this portion here, uh, what I call revolutionary innovations or disruptive innovations. And this, again, is now the low-tech right, low tech offerings, uh, but new markets. And the way I think of this, though, is... I'm using right, pop culture. I grew up on TV and movies. So for me to make sense of this, the analogies I use, right, for me, Spock epitomizes sustaining innovations. The logical person, I don't see any Star Trek t-shirts. And I don't come to these conferences. I normally see at least one person with Star Trek. Oh, we have a Star Wars. A Star Wars? OK. OK, no Star Wars t-shirts. No Star Trek t-shirts. I'm sure there's some Star Wars Trek fans in here, though. So Spock, right? he's very logical. He's going to recommend the most uh, the highest probability course of action that saves the most lives, right? At the expense of his own life in, in Star Wars 2, right? The movie, okay? So Spock is the sustaining type of innovator. For evolutionary innovations, again, for the, for the notion of you're trying to compete with someone else, I'm thinking Mad Magazine, Spy vs. Spy. Uh, any Mad Magazine fans here? I think everyone's old enough in this audience to remember Mad Magazine, right? I actually went to my nephew's house, and they actually have, the magazine's gone, right? I don't see, but they have actually books now. On, from Mad Magazine, which is a, interesting. So again, with Spy versus Spy, right, it's the white spy trying to kill the black spy, and right, and reissue, right, one, out, one outdoes the other. So that's the notion of in evolutionary incremental innovations. Now, breakthrough, I'm thinking James Bond. So I call breakthrough innovations, right, very expensive, very technology complex, right? He, well, James Bond has the entire resources of the core master division of MI6, the entire wealth of the uh, British Empire. That's uh, Bestowed onto, and I, I, I particularly I chose Piers Bros in this picture because that really was the epitome of, of breakthrough, right? He had the, the watches that could cut through diamonds. He had the BMW that he could drive with his, uh, with his Nintendo device, or actually it was a cell phone, right? And so, yeah, I'm not really thinking Daniel Craig, but if you think about it, right? When Daniel Craig evolved, they were trying to get him towards being more revolutionary. But the last two, right, he's using a lot of high-tech gizmos. So, yeah, he's in the breakthrough category as well. So revolutionary, I'm thinking MacGyver, right? MacGyver is making do with whatever tool sets he has. Americans, right? MacGyver, right? He's got the Swiss Army knife. Yeah, that was not American. It was a Swiss Army knife. So he's got a Swiss Army knife, and he's using his wits to outsmart his opponents, or at least to defuse the nuclear bomb that's about to go off. Now, I normally put this other picture. Yeah, we do have some younger folks in here. So if you don't recognize MacGyver, now, it is on CBS, Friday nights, I think at 8 o'clock. There's a reboot. Plug for CBS there. So if you don't remember MacGyver, it's Jason Bourne. Okay, so that's the character I'm thinking is doing things with revolution, right? Using his own resources to outsmart his opponents, right? The Mini Coop that was driving a little to the left, right? Didn't break very well, okay? But he was able to do that, right? So he's using everything at his disposal. So if you're looking at this, again, I'm trying to make sure you understand these quadrants, and what I'm calling is these different types of innovation. Now, one of these, I tell, I'm, a, I'm a military intelligence officer. So what most folks think of military intelligence officers, they're thinking spies, right? These guys up here. So Spock's sword doesn't fit the mold, okay? So, yeah, so Spock doesn't fit the mold, so let's get rid of him. I don't want Spock, okay? So any Mission Impossible fans? Okay, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking Tom Cruise Mission Impossible. Right, he's got the breakthrough innovations. Remember that glove that he's climbing that uh, the Burj Al Khalif, the tallest building in the world. Right? It gives away a little time. It gets a little fritzy. But high tech stuff, right? Can fail. Um, I'm thinking again, still Larry Nimoy, Mission Impossible. Again, for the young folks, you can 
find it on Amazon Prime. Mission Impossible, it's black and white. Okay. Um, Leonard Nimoy's char character is Paris. Right? If you remember, most of the characters in Mission Impossible, they use deception. So Spock, here, or in this case, uh, Paris, he spoke 10 different languages. Granted, it was for an English-speaking audience, so it was just different dialect every time he spoke. Uh, but he was fooling his uh, Krasnovian or Russian or whatever country they were trying to feed at the time. Uh, and it was not just him, right? He had a, a cohort of folks that were trying to fool uh, government agencies into thinking, right, they were doing certain things for them. Um, let's see. Yeah, not from a mathematical perspective. Again, I told you, I'm, I'm, I teach systems engineering, so I tell my cadets, I always want math to prove right, what their thesis is. So I don't like that I don't have these no numbers on my scales, right? Any business majors? Whoa, any business majors? Okay, so in business school, right, you can actually, in business school, they teach you, you can categorize the world by a two by two matrix, right? So, but I don't like these that have no scales. So as a mathematician, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want a scale. So let's think about really what, if I add one more, uh, one more axis now, offset potential, right? What innovations have the greatest impact for changing or potential to change the environment? Well, if we think about it, it's really those top two, right? The bottom two, they happen almost by nature, right? And by, by human nature, they, that happens. So really, if I change a scale and just look at for offset potential, it's really, this is probably more realistic uh, representation of what I'm really talking about. Revolution and breakthrough innovations are the, the innovations that business books are talking about doing, taking risks doing this. They're not taking about, talking about taking risk and sustaining an evolutionary innovation. Right? That happens naturally. Uh, human beings already do that. Now, the other way of looking at that, instead of looking at potential for, for change, how about probably success? Right? That's the opposite now. Right? Now it's revolution and breakthrough innovations, very small chance of success. Okay? I still have no numbers, so you, again, all you math majors out there, yeah, hold on. I'm going to justify it in just a little while. Okay? But this will be a more representational uh, look of the, the, um, the graph itself. So if I go back now, now, it wasn't too long ago, 2010, 2011, right, six years ago. Everyone remember the Arab revolts, the Green Revolution, the Arab Spring, right? A total of, it actually started, all started off right in Tunisia. The Tunisian police, right, they confiscated the, the fruits and vegetables of this vendor selling on the streets. And that was his livelihood. And what the guy did was, because of that, he self, set himself on fire. He self-immolated himself. And so that sparked, right, with social media, it sparked, and it's amazing, it sparked 13 other revolts uh, around the Middle East, North Africa. So does anyone remember how many of these, these revolts were successful? Not that long ago, right? We still have, we have still some going on, right? Syria is still going on. Yeah. We had Tunisia, that government fell. We had Egypt fall. The king of Egypt uh, was replaced. Yemen fell. That's why there's a lot of problems still in Yemen, right? There's still a lot of military fighting in Yemen because that really hasn't been resolved. The government's fallen, but hasn't been resolved. And we also had uh, Libya, right? Gaddafi was taken out of power and then he got killed two years later. Um, so four, four out of 14. Not good odds, right? At least it's giving us closer. I actually do not count Egypt. Egypt was a military coup. Okay, being a member of the military, I can tell you the U.S. military is inefficient because Congress doesn't like this. Everyone remember the Romans, Julius Caesar? Whenever Julius Caesar marched his army, what was it, across the Rubicon? That was bad news for the senators, right? Because that means the army, who now pledges loyalty to Caesar, is now under his control. They don't pledge loyalty to the Senate. They don't pledge loyalty to Rome. Okay, so so when I talk, when I always come to these conferences, it's always usually, usually as a talk about how efficient the government is. I can tell you that is not true. The government is, at least the military, is inefficient for primarily this reason. We don't like military coups. And that's okay. So in my personal case, uh, we generally move about every three years. So in my 22 years as a military officer, I've moved 11 times. So a lot higher than... Uh, I'm normal. So once every two years, on average, I move. Uh, that's probably either a good thing or a bad thing. I'll let you guys figure what that <laughs> means. Um, so again, uh, again, our 
military tends not to be very efficient. So, okay. So again, here's the numbers, right? So if you actually look at it, 71% uh, successful, revolu uh, unsuccessful revolutions, right? Revolutions are tough. Yeah. One military coup, 7%, and then about 21%. So about 20% success rate. Okay. Um, I actually think that's pretty high. Right? I pretty much think it's probably in the teens or lower, uh, low single digits. But I'm, I'm willing to accept 20% as a pretty good rough figure for successful military um, or any type of revolution. Okay. So if we look at, again, um, I told you I was Star Wars, a Star Trek fan. I'm also a Star Wars fan. Again, do not let Hollywood convince you that revolutions are easy. Because, again, if you watch Star Wars, right, you probably think... And even, right, the more recent one, the Rogue One, the prequel to Star Wars, you think revolutions are easy. Yeah, a lot of folks died, but the main characters lived, right? So you think revolutions are easy, right? We can do this to any company. Any company, startup company, we can do this all the time. Right? But if you really think about it, it's the folks on the evolutionary side, right? Again, I still think it's majorly bang average at best, right? I actually think that uh, Empire Strikes Back was the better movie, of all the movies, I kind of like Empire Strikes Back the best. Because when the umpire figures out there's a revolution, bad things happen to the rebels. Right? They get killed. And so the reality is right, evolutionary innovations right, much more successful, higher probability of success. That's why in Syria, uh, personally, uh, as a counterinsurgency uh, uh, practitioner, I do not think Syria will fall now that they've got the Russian back, even with the U.S. backing. Right? We're giving a lot of resource to the uh, rebel forces, whoever they are, that there's there's a whole bunch of them out there, but it's, that's for a different talk. Okay. Let's see. Another way of looking at this, instead of the quadrants, is through a timeline. Okay. So if we look at these green innovations, right, sustaining evolutionary innovations, um, there is improvement over time. Right? It's not like it's static. Right? People demand innovation, demand improvements, demand new features. Right? Your cars are getting better. Uh, your computers, more power, faster processing speeds. Right? Your cell phone, it's bigger. Well, at one time it was getting smaller and smaller. Now they're getting bigger and bigger. But I guess that's what the people want. Uh, so those are new features, okay? But where, so where does breaking, breakthrough and disruptive fall? Well, I told you breakthrough is jumping the curve. And so breakthrough is actually jumping the curve because it's targeting a new market and it goes above what the market expects. Okay? But again, I told you, major league bagging average at best. What about disruptive innovations? That, that's below, right? Disruptive innovations fall below the market expectation line. How is it possible that you can never sell something down here to a market that's already up here. Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? Well, that's the whole notion of these, uh, these two Harvard Business School professors, Joseph Bauer and Clayton Christian, they studied the failure of leading companies to stay at the top of their game when technologies and markets change. They studied this thing right here. They call it disruptive innovations. And there's, history is, has tons of examples. Right. Anyone remember... Um, Xerox, we still call it Xeroxing, right? The name when you photocopy something, it's still called Xeroxing? Yeah, they invented the uh, photocopier. What does Xerox focus on? They focus on the main big markets, right? The universities, the big corporations. Does anyone remember the size of the print rooms or print divisions? Did you have print divisions back then? They were the size of this room. Printers, huge printers, right? They could do everything you wanted. Right? Hole punch, staple, collate, everything that small printers can do these days. Back then, it was gee whiz stuff, especially for universities, right? They were printing lots of uh, pseudo textbooks for students, so it was cheaper. But that's the notion. So what did Canon come along with? Who did Canon focus on? What was their market? They weren't marketing the big universities. They weren't marketing the Fortune 500 companies. Who is Canon focused on? First of all, yeah, the home-based business, right? Inferior, right? Uh, initially far worse than one or two mainstream areas. Xerox laughed at Canon when they came out with their, their rinky-dinky home-based printer. Because they said quality's terrible. Dots per inch, whatever they were using at the time, inferior. I say, so Xerox laughed at Canon. But Canon said, we're going we're gonna to target a new market, right? a, a non-existent market. It's far inferior. In this case, it was far inferior. Xerox laughed at them. But enough people have bought onto it, right? home-based businesses. There were a lot more of them, apparently, than Xerox thought about. That uh, it initially appealed to small emerging market. Right? But then, as it improved over time, right, all the value criteria improves right? as more people in the emerging market. No longer becomes the emerging market. It is the market. 
So displaced Xerox uh, over time. What about Apple versus uh, IBM? Very similar, very similar story, right? IBM's claim to fame back then, early 80s, late 70s, they focused on the mainframe. Apple said, same as Canon, we're gonna focus on personal computers, right? I don't want people to go to the mainframe, let, let people have the autonomy to work however they want. Car industry is a big one. This one, uh, this one actually took a shock to, to force the change. Back in 1979, anyone remember what happened? Why there was a shift from the big three automakers in the US to the Japanese companies? 1979? Gas prices. Gas prices. Oil embargo, Iranian uh, hostage crisis. Uh, the president, right, President Carter said, ah, you have our hostages? Guess what, we're not gonna buy your oil. So the oil embargo. So all of a sudden, right, fuel prices shot up. What was the valued criteria now? Right? It wasn't the big cars with the great acceleration. It was now fuel efficiency. Quality wasn't initially there. Right? We think of Honda and Toyota as quality. Quality was not there. They were on par probably with the big three. But over time, fuel efficiency gained over, and then uh, quality started to exceed then the big three. Who's beating out Honda and Toyota now? Who's disrupting Honda and Toyota? Uh, Tesla, so Tesla, do you think Tesla is, as a, in a revolutionary sense? I think Tesla is more on the breakthrough, right? Pretty expensive. How about a South Korean company? Uh, Kia, Hyundai, they're the same company, right? Kia is a subsidiary of Hyundai. Yeah, Kia and Hyundai, right? What about their quality? Quality of Hyundai and Kia. Who remembers Kia and Hyundai about 10 years ago? Terrible, right? The Hyundai Excel, that was a terrible car. But now they're getting rave reviews, right? They've They've essentially, yeah, Toyota, Honda, they've come up this line, gone to the green line. Now it's Hyundai, Kia that's now displacing Honda, Toyota. Now who's gonna displace Hyundai? There are companies out there that are gonna displace Hyundai, possibly. It's hard to do, right, we call it 30%. There's a company in China called Cherry. They're doing the same thing. They're producing cars at the low end. They're producing the low end. India, Tata they're producing cars at the low end. Whether or not they succeed remains to be seen, but this pattern keeps getting repeated, right? Car energy, they figured it out. We want market share, we don't care about quality market share. But again, even Toyota tried it, right? Toyota tried it with Scion. They were trying to target, Scion is no longer in business, right? So again, this notion of disruptive innovations revolutions, it's tough to do, um, can't be failures. Last one, uh, I had a, I gave this talk before and so someone asked me, well, where is it happening today? I, I thought this whole notion of disruptive innovations was blase, I was pretty high, high tech or new, new thoughts uh, about 10 years ago. Where's, where's disruptive innovation taking place? It's taking place all over, I can tell you that much. But here's the, anyone still use a Blackberry? I use a Blackberry, the government gives it to me. <laughs> Efficiency, right, I told you, it's, government's great. And that's, it's still pretty good, it has some pretty good security features, but uh, they have their own smartphone now. But uh, in, at, their, at BlackBerry Rim's height, uh, back during President Obama's first administration, in the middle of his first, 21% 20, of the market share. They've got 1% of the market share now. They're not getting it back, it's tough. Um, so iPhone and Android phones pretty much disrupted BlackBerry. Uh, what was BlackBerry's, what was the feature that BlackBerry thought they couldn't live without, people couldn't live without? Keyboard, Keyboard. yeah, right? They had typing contests, right, text contests, so you could type the fastest. BlackBerry couldn't get away from that. Uh, yeah, you can still have it, right? <laughs> you can still use the big keyboards. Yeah, you got your laptop, you can still use your laptop. <laughs> so again, this notion that it's easy to do breakthrough and revolution, I just want to highlight, it's tough, right? 30% at best, major league batting averages. I'm thinking closer to 20, 10%, okay? So if you're thinking about doing revolution or disruptive or breakthrough and jump and curatized innovation, uh, think very serious about it because it's a, uh, uh, that's a cutthroat industry. It's, it's very tough to succeed. Uh, let's see, what do I want to talk about here? So really, when I, want, when, I, when I want to talk about cyber defense for the nation for this century, so what innovations, I, I've been harping on disruptive innovations, right, this entire talk, right, so disruptive innovations are critical, right, we need to be doing it, we need to be doing these revolutionary types of innovation. We also need to be doing breakthrough, okay, plus we also need to be doing sustaining evolution. We need to be doing all types of innovation, right. There's, right now, the U.S. continues to say that we have a core competency in innovation. What I'm hoping this talk does is it puts a framework. I have heard some folks come after me, I give these talks and they say, 
yeah, but you know, really innovation is more of an art than a science. Yeah, I would agree with that, right? I think innovation is more of an art to it because you can't really, hey, start innovating, start innovating, right? You really can't order someone to innovate. But isn't it great to have this framework in mind? So when you start targeting, especially for small companies, when you start targeting your innovations, I'm hoping you're really not targeting breakthrough because who's doing great breakthrough innovation? The US government, right? We use taxpayer money, right? Lots of money. We have the time to do it. So let the US government figure this out, right? NASA, great example, right? Getting folks into space, getting folks to Mars. Very expensive proposition. So let the US government do that. Yeah, maybe SpaceX might be doing a little bit of that too. But that's okay. It's going to be failures. I want folks to be focused on revolutionary. That's what our that's where our resources are. Use whatever's at our disposal to do. And the great thing is talk today. I saw a lot of them will be on revolutionary innovation. So I'm excited about the rest of the day. Now, I am concerned about this from a US military officer's perspective. The reason I like talking about this and using this presentation for military is because if you think about our last major conflicts, the ones where the US has lost or not really won, right? It all started with the Korean War, right? The war that President Truman never called a war. It was a police action even though you know, MacArthur had at least 200,000 soldiers under his command. United Nations command, though. Yeah, Korean War. If we don't think about disruptive innovations, right, that's what our enemy is doing. They know we're the superpower. They will not attack us, right? If they're smart, they will not attack our military with a frontal attack. They will not attack us with military might. In the Korean War, the Chinese army, whether or not they figured it out, whether or not it was deliberate, they negated MacArthur's intelligence. Again, this is back in 19, early 1950s. Korean War started in 1953. What was the great invention, intelligence invention in the 1950s? It has something to do with TV, right? Wasn't TV very popular? Photography. John MacArthur relied on photography, right? Aerial, sur aerial surveillance. We had air dominance over Korea. Right? We controlled the skies. North Korea, no airplanes by the time the UN forces came in. We dominated the skies. We could see everything that was happening. Right? MacArthur just set the planes out. And they go, What's the problem with wet film photography? One huge problem with film. <laughs> it needs light. <laughs> so everyone's seen that, uh, you know, all these new movies coming out, how you defeat all these high-tech satellites. And they're like, yeah. There's ways to defeat almost every innovation. In this case, the Chinese moved at night. Okay. Uh, in the, again, I'm an intel officer, so I felt sorry for MacArthur's intel. We call it the J2, his joint intel chief. Uh, the estimates are they severely underestimated the Chinese strength by a factor of 10 for every encounter. You can't win a battle. I don't care how technologically advanced you are. You can't win a battle 10 against 1. It's tough. Um, so that was every battle against the Chinese, 10 against 1. Actually, it was actually worse, right? Their estimates were 5 against 1. The reality was 10 against 1. That's what it was. Vietnam War. Air power again, right? So we have, who's their Air Force? Yeah, air power. I love air power, right? But it couldn't stop the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We dropped more bombs. The U.S. dropped more bombs over the Ho Chi Minh Trail than we did all over Germany during World War II. It's amazing when you see those videos of bombings of Dresden, bombing of, that's a lot of bombs being dropped over Germany right, during World War II. We dropped more during Vietnam. And we never stopped the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Well, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was never, initially was not dependent on infrastructure. It was not a road network. It was a path, right? It was all people carrying munitions, carrying logistics, right? People transport. So if, was, if there's a crater in front of you, what did you do as a human being? Go around it. And that's what happened, right? It was all rat lines, trail lines. So if the Air Force bombed it, folks, folks are smart, right? They go around it. They hack their way across the uh, North Vietnamese uh, Viet Cong. They hack their way across our, our bombed uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. Okay. Iraq, Afghanistan, most recent conflicts. IED is not very sophisticated initially. Right? They got to be, some of them. But uh, I was stationed in Iraq uh, in 2008. It's crazy. A government efficiency again. Here's the U.S. Army. We have this placard in our vehicles. We're supposed to do a call every time we see unexploded ordnance on the battlefield or on the, in the roadways so you know, they can get the hurt locker EOD folks in and disarm them. 
there was so much over there. I thought it was a joke. Why do we even have this in our? <laughs> why do we, so if you can imagine, the Iran, Iraq, the, it was the Iran Iraq war back in the 1980s. They bombed the heck out of each other. A lot of dudded munitions still on, still are littered across the uh, battlefield. So most of that, a lot of that stuff became IEDs during the first part of the war before they started manufacturing them. So it was really just a lot of unexploded ordnance that became IEDs, right? Um, what about cyber warfare? That's really what we're talking about here, right? My contention is that nearly all malware, especially with new malware, resides in the disruptive, disruptive realm. There's no need for the malware to be in this space, right? It's so easy, right? We're going to have talks all day. We have one that's someone's talking about malware, then, now, and today, or something like that. That's going to be great. I think I like, didn't like that one. Um, I'm contending all malware starts in the disruptive space. And that's concern, right? For me, as a cyber uh, professional now, because it should be concern for all of you as well. Because guess what? I told you, the smart enemy is not going to attack our strengths. Are they going to attack our US military with cyber weapons? Sure, they can. But are they going to attack us first? I don't think so, right? Now, the chief of staff, I know it's being recorded now, the chief of staff of the Army has told me that we are not at cyber war. So I'm reiterating that right now so everyone can recognize that. We are not at war in cyber. However, have the battle started? Target, OPM, Sony, Sands Casino, right? The list goes on and on. We, we see it every day. So the battle started. Whether or not we declare war, I told you we never declared war in Korea. Right, three years, no war declared because uh, policing action. So I'll let you, you decide. I'm telling you the official position is we are not at war in cyber. Okay, so here is my concern with uh, the way our cyber defense is right now. Because right now, right, I told you most of the uh, cyber offense starts off in this revolutionary space. But yeah, yeah, it also becomes sustaining, right? Versioning control, right? They keep getting better. They start, they start using the same attack vectors to attack different companies. They're smart, right? It goes into sustaining. Or someone puts a defense up, yeah, and then they'll figure out, okay, it's a defense, but I can get around that, right? I'll just do this, this other. My kung fu is stronger than yours, right? That's all they're saying here. So there really is no reason for the offensive guy to be in that uh, breakthrough space. All right, I know what you're saying. Yeah, we have some breakthrough cyber innovations. NSA has most of those, okay? So hopefully it's NSA. Yeah, that's... Right, hopefully this is the NSA's purview. My concern is our cyber adversaries are getting this place too. So if we think about it, right, there's no really need for these guys to get in this space, but what happens when they do? We call them advanced versus the threats, after all. Right, the Chinas, the Russias, the Irans, even North Korea, it's amazing we call it North Korea advanced versus the threat. I think they have at most 100 computers. They use a lot of the Chinese computers, that's what it is. Here's my problem. If we look at cyber defense, from, particularly from the US side, we are focused here. Breakthrough innovations. Every time I hear go to a security conference, and the first word that comes out of a CEO's mouth, we need automation. To me, automation gets closer to breakthrough. Right? That's going to solve all our problems, automation. It might. Are you willing to wait that long, though? Because right, this is the gap. Yeah, there are some revolution. We're going to hear about the revolution, uh, revolutionary types of defense today. I know of definitely two talks. That definitely will be a, a revolutionary types of defense. The problem is this gap, right? As a military officer, military intelligence officer, I'm looking for the gap. Here's the offense. Here's the defense. These are coming faster, right? If the revolutionary innovation is coming faster, they're doing what they can. The breakthrough, I told you, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of resources. We're giving the adversary a whole bunch of time to play around, experiment with all this stuff before this can even be successful. And how much, what did I tell you was the success rate for this? Yeah, at best, Beta League batting average, right? 30% at best. Okay, so we're hoping what we're doing now is going to stop all this that's happening now. Okay, that's a scary proposition for me, right? You're betting 30% will stop all of that, 30% chance. I'm not too comfortable knowing that. So that's why I'm advocating more revolutionary or de disruptive uh, cyber defensive innovations. Now, if you're convinced that you need to be doing disruptive uh, revolutionary innovations, I do want to caution you. Once again, here's the, the warning sign, right? Surgeon General's warning. Most revolts fail, okay? Just remember that. But if you do want to do uh, revolts, revolutionaries, right? If you do, here's what the literature says, right? There's four ways really of doing it. 
the best way is trying to be an adap adapter of problem experimentation. That's what I'm trying to uh, encourage the Army and our military to do. I don't want to do it ourselves because we are great at breakthrough. I don't want our organization to start doing disruptive. I want experimenters, folks in this room, you experiment, we'll fund your research. You, you have a great idea, we'll fund it. That's what I'm encouraging. We actually have a couple organizations that do that now. Uh, Defense Innovation Experimental, right? Great name, D-I-U-X. That's the name, the acronym of the organization. Dukes. Uh, it's out in Silicon Valley. Uh, they just started up in Dallas. We have a, a small group in Boston. And that's what they're trying to do. Again, 30%. That's what they should be re recognizing. And finally, uh, if you're going to be doing this type of experimentation, make sure it's small, fast, and cheap. We learn much better from, from small failures than we do from big failures. Okay, human nature tells us that. Okay, make sure it's small, fast, and cheap. Make lots of them. So make lots of uh, experimentations. Recognize most of them will fail. That's okay. And you want to do two things, right? A lot of folks in the operations field, in your, in your business case studies, you can't forget the business case study. You still have to have a business that runs, right? It has to keep generating money or whatever it is that you're doing. In our case of the military, we still have to be defending the nation. Uh, but you're also looking at the future. You want to tie those two together. And the risks, okay, here's the problem. If the military especially is not doing disruptive or revolutionary innovations or experimenting with it, this is what we risk, right? We're, we're okay with evolution and sustaining, right? That's our core competency. You would say the military is, has core competency. And yeah, that's my life. Uh, uh, we do have some organizations that do a great job with breakthrough, right? Air Force, I think they do, right? Satellites, GPS, stealth. A lot of that came from the Air Force, DARPA. DARPA does a great, great thing. NASA, they do great things with breakthrough innovations, right? They have that uh, in their DNA. What, but disruptive, right? Disruptive is tough. There are a few military organizations that do it. Okay? I asked if someone was from the Marines. The Marines, right? We give the Marines the crap, the leftovers from the Army. They have to make do with what's available. So they, Marines, I think, have it in their DNA to do breakthrough, or to do revolutionary. Uh, Special Forces Army, they have that in their DNA. Someone actually, my brother in the Navy, he mentioned to me, he, the Coast Guard, it's the same thing, right? The Coast Guard gets all the leftovers from the Navy. So the Coast Guard, I think, has that in their DNA. So we do have some uh, organizations that can do it. I just don't think we do it well enough as better uh, from the civilian organizations, civilian uh, companies. Okay. And so the risk is if we never experiment, we never have that quadrant to play with. And for cyber defense, that's a large quadrant to be missing especially when a lot of the malware is coming from that quadrant. Okay. I just want to close this by thanking uh, Beth and the B-Side Springfield team. Uh, a big thanks, right? That's my big thanks with the underline. Um, and the great thing here is that uh, it's great that you're all here because I come to these conferences. I told you my very first B-Sides. You saw Colonel Hall in the, uh, the video. He's my boss. He was the one that turned, he was the one that turned me on to B-Sides. So B-Sides New York was my very first cybersecurity conference uh, two years ago. And I encourage you, uh, so if you're doing the timeline, right, uh, January 90, uh, 2015, you should be talking up here in uh, two years. Uh, B-Sides, right, you can jot it down, B-Sides 2019, 2020, uh, you and this audience will be up here. Okay. But the, the rest of the day, the reason I like coming to these conferences, um, it's not just giving a talk. The talks that you have arranged here for the morning, I've already plotted where I think these talks belong. For the afternoon, do you get a trend that all these talks are in the upper quadrants and tends to be back here? Yeah, that's why I'm trying to encourage this. The whole notion of revolutionary innovations, it's already happening. It's coming from this audience. Okay, that's what I want to capture. And uh, hopefully, if you guys are doing a great job, I'm, I'm going to be here for the rest of the day listening to these talks because I'm excited about uh, these talks. and. Uh, uh, keep doing disruptive, revolutionary innovations. Uh, re recognize that you're going to fail. Some will be failures. That's okay. Uh, but get the good ideas out there. I'm trying to encourage more military folks to attend these conferences because, right, we attend them these military conferences with other military folks, and they're telling us, they're telling us these things. This is 90% of my day. So when I come to conferences like these and hear the great ideas that are happening, I get excited. This is, I'm tr I'm trying to strive for folks to keep talking about these types of breakthrough and disruptive innovations. And so with that, um, I do have one more video, but I think I'm going to close it here uh, for questions. Yeah. So I'm familiar with MITRE. 
Yeah, a miter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So if no, no one's not familiar with miter, miter is this a think tank. Uh, there's a bunch of think tanks that do military research. Rand Corporation, miter. Um, the reality is, it's okay. I actually don't like pigeonholing folks, right? Just like what I've done here. I, I do show that they sort of span, right? They, they sort of span. But MITRE really is, is doing stuff in the center. They're doing what they're, the bad thing with MITRE is, right? They're not, they can come up with their own good ideas and research, but they're getting funded from folks that are down here. And so a lot of the research they're doing by default comes from down here. Do they have great thinkers? Yeah. I can tell you that they publish a lot of papers, which I encourage everyone here. Not only come, come think about talking, uh, publishing as well. So the first step, yeah, get up here and talk. Uh, try it out. If it's a great talk, think about writing it to a paper. And uh, if you're thinking about trying to find a place to write it, uh, we have our, go back to my, uh, yeah, just come back to this uh, website here, cyber.army.mil. We have our own journal, Cyber Defense Review. Uh, it's becoming the number one journal. I think we're number five right now. It's become the number one cybersecurity journal in the world. Uh, and so I would encourage you to take a perusal at it, take a look at the types of articles. Uh, we have a print journal and we have an online presence. And we actually have our own uh, speaking series. We have our own conference called Cyber, uh, Cyber Conflict US. That's taking place in DC on the 7th and 8th of November. Uh, we used to have a cyber talks very similar to this conference, which is why I thank Beth again and her team. We know how tough it is to put these conferences on. Uh, I've been on the other side where I'm working it. I was working the registration desk at the, at the last conference. Um, so I encourage that. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, but again, a lot of, uh, a lot of places. Rand Corporation is another one that does a lot of good, good, good work. Yeah, question back. Yeah, I, I have not yet. So the question was, do I, do I use that four quadrant chart for innovations to put pigeon countries? I, I've thought about doing that. And the reality is um, I could give this talk to different countries to encourage them to do innovation uh, because I think their problem is they don't have a framework. Uh, so I have affinity with the Koreans. I was stationed in Korea for six years. I can tell you that the Korean mindset, I know I'm putting myself in a little bit of jeopardy here. Yeah, the Koreans, they do, the hard-working folks, uh, but they're clearly, I would say, they're clearly in the evolutionary space. They're just trying to one-up the North Koreans. That's all they're doing. And they're doing a good job at it. Yeah, they are well ahead of the North Koreans, but North Korea still comes up with these crazy ideas, right? Nukes. For a country as poor as it is, it's incredible how much of, how powerful a nuclear force they have. They figure out how to stop the U.S. It's not the South Koreans are worried about for nukes. The nukes are directed against the U.S. They're, that's their deterrent. For the South Koreans, the North Koreans already have enough. I don't know if you realize, that Seoul is just 50 miles from the demilitarized zone. It's crazy. They have two, uh, over 20,000 artillery pieces just pointing at Seoul. So in one second, right, if they ever launch an attack, Seoul would be devastated. That's why for Korea, it's a conventional force that deters South Korean uh, attack. The nuclear, right, all the cyber stuff, nuclear, it's directed against the U.S. They don't want the U.S. and U.N. forces to come in. That's my personal view. Yeah. Uh, you talked about um, automation and the yeah. category of uh, Yeah, just through. breakthrough, yeah. What I see with automation, you're basically taking things that you've already figured out the pattern of how to do it, and then you're scripting yeah. it to make it, it seems like it'd be more sustaining yeah. to me. Yeah, uh, I'm good. I'm just wanting to hear correctly yeah. thinking. Yeah, so the question is, uh, I, I said I thought automation, when I heard that, I, I consider it more of a breakthrough type of uh, innovation. And the question really is, if, is really automation breakthrough or can it be sustained? It, the reality is, I told you, if things don't fall nicely, in, nicely into a, one of the quadrants, I'm okay with putting automation right in the center. I think automation can be sustaining, right? We have process assembly plants that make it sustaining. Uh, revolution, it can be revolutionary if we do it the right ways. Uh, it can be evolutionary, right? If another competitor is doing automation and we just want to compete in automation. So it can be thought of in different ways. But I would agree. Uh, I probably, through automation, my, my gut reaction is just whenever someone throws off, automation will solve all the cures of the woes of the world. I usually think they're thinking breakthrough, right? They're thinking that magic bullet that's up here that's going to fix everything. Now, that's why when I, when I hear of multi pronged approaches, right? Leveraging community, leveraging a lot of the, I write papers on this as well, and a lot of times I get rejected, right? I'm okay. 
I'm, I'm okay with 30% success rates in my papers. Uh, the common criticism I have is, you know, the innovations you're talking about, they're not what I would think of as innovations, right? And I know what they're talking about. They're thinking, yeah, it's not high-tech innovation. I'm talking about things like uh, education. I'm talking about things like uh, community. I'm talking about things like social engagement. I'm talking about things like uh, cyber hygiene. Yeah, and not, right? Low tech, I told you this stuff is low tech. I I'm gonna improve my slides next time, but uh, the mass, vast majority of Westerners, Westerners think innovation is on these two quadrants, right, high tech. I'm pushing Easterners, right? Easterners tend to think uh, there can be innovation that is not high tech. So I would agree with that. I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, thank you. Any final questions before I turn it over? I think we're gonna have to set up. Well, with that, I thank you again. I encourage you, uh, think of trying to, especially, I, I know we have some uh, newcomers. Um, if you have a great idea, especially from the talks later today, right? All these talks that I just showed you. Yeah, if you think you can do a better job or as good a job as some of these, yeah, come up, get your ideas out. And Beth will entertain those ideas and I think it'll be better for it. And this, this will be great, okay? With that, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.